we are going to talk about the fundamental concepts of differential geometry and how it is applicable to Einstein's general theory of relativity. First, we will talk about the fundamental concepts, ideas, notions, definitions and some illustrations so that we can understand the basics of differential geometry and then we are going to see how these concepts are applicable to Einstein's general relativity and the curvature of space-time. Without application, any particular discipline remains incomplete, so is differential geometry. So, after learning the basic concepts, we will see its applications and how it is used in Einstein's relativity in calculating the curvature of space-time, tensors and different other ideas. My name is Shonak and you are watching this video on my channel Physics for Students wishing you all a very happy new year. So before we go ahead and start with the concepts let us first look into what are the topics that we are covering. So first we will covering what is a manifold, what is the term ambient space means, what is called a transition map, how do we define a space, <coughs> sorry, uh, opening sets, open sets, open ball and open disk, what is called parameterizing a line, what are smooth paths and smooth surfaces. We will also learn how to use those parameters, what are called charts and atlas, relativity and differential geometry, how they are related to each other, Euclidean and Minkowski space, uh, what are those things, differential geometry and how it can be applicable to the curvature of space-time, the big picture where I will be uh, speaking on certain very important factors and then we will go for a summary. So, this is the agenda. Uh, it might happen for some of the viewers who are watching this video, some of the concepts you already know because in my lecture series of differential geometry, I have covered those concepts. However, I will be a little bit more detailed, elaborative and mathematical by trying to understand however, I will stick to the basics, make it absolutely simple, no too much of equations will be there and fairly illustrative so that you can understand the concepts easily. So first we will understand what is a manifold. Before going to the details of manifold, uh, uh, you know, mathematical notions, I will just wanted to give, want to give you a very basic idea. Now we know that differential geometry actually deals with certain structures. Structures, I mean to say, shapes and objects of different, uh, uh, different parts. Now if I take a kind of a, this a child's play and making what we call a building block, so, you know, these are the building blocks on a Cartesian space and these blocks, whether it is a, a triangle, it is a parallelopiped, it is a parallelogram or a square, they need a building base, right? So, as you can see on the left hand side, these are piled up. So, maybe on a floor or on a piece of cardboard, but somehow they are located. So, they need a base to build on. Now, when I talk of these kinds of shapes, a hyperboloid or a sphere or anything, a Klein bottle, etc. These shapes also need to build a base. These shapes also need to stand and these shapes also need a base to build on. So, manifold is a topological space that locally resembles a Euclidean space. That means in order to build those weird kind of shapes which you can see right on the screen, we need a building base. So, what is that base? That base is called manifold. Because we will learn soon that when these shapes are being used, it is not that the Cartesian coordinates will follow. So, we will need a different kind of a thing and that is what is called a manifold. So, in order to go for understand a manifold, first thing that we need to understand is that it locally resembles Euclidean space. That means the space, the structure, the building, uh, the airport that we look all around, it sometimes, it, it looks like that. Why? Because that becomes easier for us to calculate. Okay, so if I take a kind of a structure like this, right? So a curve, uh, for example, through a 3D Euclidean space. Now, what I wanted to say that this is a curve, say, for example. So this line, a line can be parameterized, for example, by a single variable, for example, x of t, y of t, and z of t. And a similarly, a line can be parameterized by two variables which can be x u v, y u v and z u v, right? 
these objects are considered to be locally similar to one dimension or a two dimension Euclidean space which is R and R2 which I have given. So again just I told you that it locally resembles Euclidean space. So these can be locally similar to one, two and two, uh, two dimension. More specifically we say that there is a continuous one to one mapping between the local curve and a flat space. Okay. So I will just show you we consider for example the same one this T and there is a tangent right at some point P to match the curve perfectly at infinite simul scale. So what I was trying to tell if this is the line so that is what important that there is a continuous one to one mapping between the local and the curve says and we will soon see that this is no doubt homeomorphic. So a manifold is uh, so this is a kind of a, a you know uh, this is a tangent at some point P to match the curve perfectly at infinite simul scales. That means it's just touching at one point at infinite simul scale. It's match perfectly at the at the, at the infinite simul scales. Okay. So now that we know that uh, this one to one mapping between the local and the flat space is called homeomorphic. I would like to uh, you know address to this definition very simply. So what we called homeomorphism that because we know it is a one to one mapping. So if I take a function which uh, for example from x it maps to y then between two topological spaces it is considered to be homeomorphic. If it is a bijection number two if it is a continuous and the function as well as the inverse of the function is true. So here it is a manifold is a space which is homeomorphic to some r m locally but may be different for rm globally which is called an ambient space. We will soon define don't worry what is an ambient space. So we are able to describe the manifold using a set of m coordinates <coughs> sorry with which are the local coordinates however if the manifold is not homeomorphic then we have to use several of these local coordinates which used in case of a transition. But we will look later on that. But so this part is clear that this one to one mapping is called homeomorphism only and only when the when there are three uh, conditions which is satisfied. It should be the function f should be have a bijection. It should have a continuous and the inverse of the function is also true. So we go forward and we try to understand that uh, so yeah. So uh, using M, yeah, a set of M called local coordinates. So let us quickly look into what is called uh, locally uh, resemble. So here is a person who is walking on a sphere, for example, from here to here, here to here, and so on. <coughs> right. So this person, and if I map the same kind of a manifold, it is on a manifold. From a sphere, I move into a manifold. And I'm tracking the same persons walking from this place to this place to this place to this place. So what happens is that it locally resembles Euclidean space near each point. That means if I am out of there in the space or if I have moved out from the sphere, then what I can do is that I can look into it and I can say, okay, this is a sphere. But when I plot those plots or points on a local manifold or a local space, it locally resembles Euclidean. So this is the global part and this is what is called is the local part. So this is how we basically visualize a manifold that it was saying that it locally resembles Euclidean how it is. Okay, so I will quickly go over and try to uh, make you understand what is an ambient space although it is not a very technical Java but it is good to understand. So an ambient space, especially in geometry and topology, is called the space surrounding a mathematical object, any kind of a mathematical object. Now, for example, for a one-dimensional line L may be studied in isolation, in which case the ambient space of L is L. Okay, or it may be studied as an object embedded in two-dimensional Euclidean space R2, right? In uh, which case the ambient space of L is R2. Or as an object embedded in two dimensional hyperbolic space, in which case the ambient space of L is H2, right? So, to see why this makes a difference, let us consider this line parallel lines intersect uh, 
never uh, parallel lines never intersect so this is true if the ambient space is r2 right and it falls if the ambient space is h2 that is the hyperbolic one so because the geometric properties of r2 are different totally from h2 and right on the right hand part of the screen as you can see that i have given three geometrical you know uh, depiction uh, the straight and braided curves and the uh, euclidean the uh, elliptical and the hyperbolic so this is actually just a quick definition of what is an ambient space although ambient space uh, from that the word ambience actually comes that means uh, the restaurant's ambience or the ambience of people so that means a mathematical object where uh, the uh, the space surrounding that specific object okay so when we talk of manifold i will just like to quickly give you a better example with a circle right so uh, uh, say a circle is the simplest as you know of a topological manifold so as topology ignores bending so a small piece of circle is treated as a small piece of a line okay so considering uh, the unit circle x squared plus y squared equals to 1 where y coordinate is positive so yes the y coordinate is positive so we can just draw this so any point of this arc is can be uniquely described by its x coordinate so the projection also on the first coordinate is continuous and in a in vertical mapping so here we get this coordinate this points towards this this points towards this and this one and this one right i just uh, wanted to show you on that so what happens is that these functions with the open regions which they map are basically called charts so for example i have got a x top xy then i have got an x bottom these are just figures right and then i have got an x left and i have x right so together these parts i mean to say these entire parts who cover the whole circle and the four charts form basically what is called an atlas right we are, we will go into more into charts and atlas but as because manifold is important so these uh, functions right along with the open regions that they map uh, these are called charts and the charts actually comprises of the atlas okay we will take forward this figure just to give you an idea that a manifold is actually is described by an atlas and an atlas is consists of individual charts and charts are basically individual regions of the manifold okay so we go forward and take this one and we see these four uh, parts of it right so we have got the x top x right x left and uh, uh, x bottom right so both now what happens is that these regions they overlap right uh, this part the interval 0 1 and they will overlap so we can form a kind of a function like this right 0 1 to uh, 0 1 with the x right and this can be constructed which takes values from the codomain x top right and uh, and it gets back to the circle using the inverse so followed by the x right so we can write something like this so we can construct a function which takes value from the codomain x top and goes back to the circle using the inverse followed by the x right so that is why we are saying that this overlapping of the domain happens so we can go forward and see how actually the equation forms the equation forms something like this this and this it's a pretty kind of an easy calculation so if you see this kind of a uh, you know chart where this rn and rn they have been mapped over here so this is something which is called a transition map right we will come to transition map so a transition map when we are comparing two charts of an atlas to make the comparison we consider the comparison composition of one chart with the inverse of the other so the first chart will be the inverse and both has to be smooth uh, right at this moment you might think that what are those charts and atlas do they really come to use in physics yes it comes and that is the objective prime objective of this video i will just show you but before that we need to look into quickly what is a transition map so uh, what i would say is that a transition map provides a way of comparing comparing two charts of atlas so to make this comparison we consider the composition of one chart with the inverse of the other right 
So the composition is not well defined until we restrict both the charts to intersection of the domains. Okay. Now let me give you an example before going to these figures. For example, if we have a chart of Europe and that of chart of Russia, then we can compare these two charts as they overlap with each other. Something which is called Eurasia, right? Certain part of Europe getting overlapped by Eurasia. Okay, so let us consider this U alpha and phi alpha. These are two charts for a manifold uh, M such that, yes, this one the uh, is non-empty. That means uh, I'm talking of the intersection is not empty. That means this one as you can U alpha, U beta, M being the manifold. So this comes. So the transition map is this. This is the, right, this is the transition map. So the map is defined by this. And let us note that phi alpha and phi beta are both homeomorphic. So the transition map tau alpha beta is also homeomorphic. So the transition map is basically comparing those two maps and trying to find out something which overlaps and how the function and the inverse function in that case really works out. So that is basically what is called a transition. Uh, let us not go much more deep into that because we have certain other important aspects also to cover. Okay, so we come to what is called distance, open sets, curves and surface. Now, the distance that we usually know that those are Cartesian coordinate distances. But as we move into manifold and your differential geometry, the distance notion changes. So it is important that we can define uh, distance notion. So, formally to declare the space that we are working, an n-dimensional Euclidean space can be written as this. Right. So, here we first declare this one which is called uh, this. Each dimension of this Euclidean space is an element of the real space. We also use this. This actually means restricted by. And we are told that the membership symbol you already know that each dimension of the Euclidean space is an element of real space. So, for example, we can take an example of this also, uh, where this is actually the real line and this represents the real numbers, which is the real line, this E1. So, it can also be looked upon as this. So, this is familiar to Cartesian coordinates. So, these are just examples just to show you. So, we can define a space uh, using this because this time the space is something different from Cartesian space. So, E3 is called for Euclidean space. Now, these are very common. I will just quickly skip over this. The magnitude of a vector, you know how we take the absolute value, distance from the origin. In similar manner, the distance between two points can be taken as this and calculated as this. This is fairly simple. Nothing much to worry. Right. Okay. We come to the next important concept, which is called open sets. Now, open sets actually is itself a big subject. And I think I can make a uh, a good video on open sets, but the objective of this video is not to tell you open sets, but build on the, uh, you know, uh, I would say the build on the concepts of differential geometry. So first, I would like to give you a very basic understanding of open sets. So the term open set is commonly defined as that that does not contain its boundary elements. So closed set is then one that does. That means. Open set doesn't contain its boundary, but closed set considers the boundary. What do we mean by that? Let me show you. For example, this is a, a kind of a set. For example, these are the points which are considered. So the set of all points that lie within or on the border of the disk of the closed set. So you see, I have uh, the red dots, uh, the, the the black ones in the borders also. So it is a closed set. However, if I take these things, then the set of points that lie within the disk but not on the border forms an open set. As simple as that. Right. So, these are the, uh, uh, this one and the internal of the set and as well as the borders. But here in open set is something we will consider uh, those which do not lie on the border. Okay. So, we will take a kind of a, you can call it as a manifold like this and we take, uh, you know, two open sets. These are the boundaries, radius. This is the open set. This is the boundary. So, at the edge of the open set, we can find some circle of radius r, which is still contained in u. Okay. So, here is a formal definition. A subset u of E n is called open. This is the way it is written. Right. If for every point, 
of y in u these are points right in u all points of en with some positive distance of r of y are also in u but remember that the r can vary in size so intuitively an open set is some region i mean to say minus its boundary here it is so if we include the boundary we get a closed set a closed set goes right up to the edge of the boundary so no circle of radius r can be drawn at every point uh, and and still be in u so that is how the closed set is this is fairly clear okay some quick examples of open sets for example e sub n is open that is euclidean real space has no boundaries this is an notion of empty set is open union of sets are open union is denoted by this big cup uh, is a set of all distinct elements of the collection and extension of the above from here what we can say that open sets are actually unions of open balls i will come to that so here is a nice picture of uh, the open sets right these are union of open balls which we can put b right here b means ball we will come soon what is a open ball but simply an open set can be considered to have an open ball at each point open sets can be considered as to have open ball at each point right so this is how open sets are we are just coming now to what is an open ball so open set can be considered to have an open ball at each point just take this picture or you can take a snapshot right now so that it becomes easy for you to understand okay so uh, sorry so if i take a kind of a point say for example this right and draw a straight line of radius r and thereby i draw a circle so what happens is that all those small 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 points we will consider them to be balls right all those small 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 these uh, blue uh, circles these are all open balls that's it these are all open balls just like open set it should be within the circle or within the set and it should not exceed or lie on the bottom so if i draw a line that like this this is okay so open ball is also sometimes called a open sphere so in euclidean space a ball is the volume bounded by a sphere remember it's a ball is the volume bounded by the sphere in mathematics a ball is a solid figure bounded by a sphere it is also called solid sphere it may be closed ball including the boundary points that constitute the sphere or open ball excluding them so how do we define that so now that we know that uh, it has to be within the limits so we take a metric x and each point we say x is an element of big x and here is how we define simple b of x of r b is the for ball where y is the element of x and the distance function y comma x should be less than r what happens if it is more than r we will just see right now so r here the radius should be greater than 0 so here is an open sphere now if i take this open sphere and these are the two lines which are permitted but if i take a line here right this one this won't be permitted right this won't be permitted because it should be less than r here it is greater than r right and we can write it in the same way v x of r it it actually means the same so just to summarize till now what we have learned is that open set and open ball these are uh you know types of measurement now if i go back to my previous slide now i would like to show you something here you see i have shown an open set can be considered to have an open ball at each point why because this is the open set this this blue one the dotted one right and it should have open ball because the open ball are not lying on the boundary and not outside somewhere because it's, it is always less than r so that is why an open set because it's a collection of those points which are within the sets and these collections are open balls hence if i go back here then i get what is an open ball and that is why these are the same open ball a open sets is a collection of open balls quite clear till now okay we can generalize this open ball further right into something which is called an open disk the definition remains the same we got certain points and we draw radius so this line is permitted the, those red lines right but this one it is bigger bigger than r so it is not permitted so we are not considering the points which are the boundary distance between points and center is less than r again if i take a circle 
So circle in circle distance between points and center is R. Various in the case of a disc, closed disc, distance between uh, center and point is yeah less than equals to R. This is an open disc, this is a circle, and this is a closed disc, right? So considering all those points, uh, uh, open open balls are uh, those points which are in the open sets. Each point of open sets are open balls. It should not be uh, on the boundary or beyond that. It should be less than R and it can be generalized as open disk. So this is the uh, distance function. Here we use D for disk. This is for the uh, less than R square. That means it, it is a open disk and if you get a closed disk, this would be uh, this one less than equal to R square, right? Okay. We move on to the next part. That means parametric paths, surfaces, smooth paths and smooth surfaces. Now, again, there is a utility. I am coming to that. Why we are using parametric paths in order to make equations much similar. Okay. So, we get a kind of a, uh, if we want to parameterize a straight line, right? So, we want to parameterize a straight line. So, in order to parameterize a straight line, we need to know at least one point and the direction of the line. So, if we know two points, say for example, it passes through here, then we can find its direction. So, the parameterization of a line is generally given by this, R of t equals to q plus t v, where u is a point on the line and v is a vector parallel to that. So, we, we will take uh, an example. For example, it is passing through 1, 1, 1 and 4, 6, 2. So, we get from here u equals to 1, 1, 1 and v equals to 4, 6, 2. Then one possible parameterization would be this one, where we can write this one minus this one. And then we write it in this way, r of t, 1, 1, 1 plus t, right, here. So this is the vector which is just parallel. As I told you, that is uh, u is one point on the line and v is vector parallel. So this is one. And we can also write in this way, right. X, there is a different ways of parameterization. Uh, I am so sorry, the, the this one would be 3rt. Anyway, 1 plus 5t and 1 plus t. So, these are the ways in which we can parameterize things, right? Okay, so a surface is smooth if it is locally homeomorphic to your Euclidean plane. This is what we call smooth surface. So, locally homeomorphic to Euclidean plane, we have just seen that. Now, if you take a kind of a, this kind of a shape, right? And these are the boxes, that means we are using differential calculus in order to differentiate them. So, here it is. So, R of n, as you see, x1, x2, it goes dot, dot, dot up to n. So, these paths and these are almost similar. So, a surface is smooth because these are two locally homeomorphic. Why? Because if S is continuous, its inverse is also continuous. Here is a nice and a famous example, how the cup turns to donut and the donut turns to cup. So these, uh, you know, on the sh on, on these white boxes, these are something which is similar to R n x one x two, and it goes up to x n. Okay, so I would like to define smoothness of a function is a property assumed by the number of continuous derivative. That means it should have a continuous derivative over some domain. So continuous derivative, what does it mean? Means the function is differentiable. A function is differentiable and the derivative is a continuous function. So, if f is differentiable, it will go on and go on, f prime and f uh, double prime and so on, continuous. So, this is a differentiable function, right? This is a non-continuous function because you can see it's a brick. So, I take this shape and I try to differentiate, differentiate, differentiate continuously. And this would be a differentiable structure because I can differentiate it and this red line is a continuous derivative, right? So, it will continue and continue and continue, then only we call it as smooth. So, immediately you might find there is a question cropping up in your mind that is a straight line smooth? Let us find it out in the next part of our video. But right now, I think it is quite clear the smoothness we have defined, continuous derivatives, only it will happen when uh, it is continuous derivative. Continuous derivative means that the function obviously it will be differentiable, but the derivative that we will get 
is also a continuous function. So I have shown an example of derivative and a continuous and a non-continuous and how these structures visually looks like. So continuous derivatives can be one as differentiable, another as continuous function. Uh, these are examples of non-differentiable functions. So there is a corner as you can see on the left hand graph. As the second one shows a discontinuity and the third one shows a vertical tangent. This is quite smooth, this straight line, but it is not differentiable. So these are continuous examples to demonstrate that what is actually a non-differentiable function, what is smoothness, because these will come to relativity very soon. So what we can say? We can say a smoothness or smooth surface should be locally homeomorphic to an Euclidean plane and should have a continuous derivative over some domain. And for example, is infinitely differentiable and it goes up to C infinity function. Also, uh, allow to differentiate as many times as you want. So it goes on and on. You see, this is continuous up to infinity. So if it go, if it if it go, if it if a function has got a value or it stops after differentiating, definitely that function is not smooth. So here I have, to have just take an example of f of x equal to sine x, and if you continuously differentiate, it will go up to infinity. That means I am allowed to differentiate as many times as I want. So, if I take a structure like this and I can, uh, you know, this all boxes means I am differentiating and it will continue infinitely. Okay, so we come to what is called a smooth path and the smooth surfaces. So, uh, what happens is that if you take this kind of a shape, right? So, here is the definition. A smooth surface is immersed in E3. That means Euclidean three dimension, right? Uh, just normal the VP thing. It is immersion. It is immersed in E3, right? And it is a collection of three smooth real valued functions of two parametrizing, generally two parametrizing, x1 and x2. Remember these upper indices are referred to local coordinates. These are not squaring of the value. It can be written as this, right? So if you hold, uh, okay, so these are the local coordinates, right? x1 and x2, these are local coordinates. So the sur the smooth surface requires by definition. So if if I see these, these are the parametrizing. So now you understand. So we can plug in any value uh, for parametrizing. So now uh, what happens is that if I take here x one constant, and if I take x two constant, then we get a smooth path, right? So if I get different constant, it yields to different paths. Similarly, holding x one and x two. Uh, constant gives another batch of paths which intersect the first ones. So if we hold x1 and x2 constant, uh, I mean to say, then what we get is called a smooth path. So this is a nice example. Okay. So a smooth path in E3, I would like to say, so this was smooth surface. Now, uh, yeah, this was a smooth surface. So how does it look like? Now we come to what is called a smooth path. So smooth path in E3, that is Euclidean 3, is a set of three smooth, again, infinitely differentiable. This is important because by definition, smoothness is infinitely differentiable. Real valued functions of a single variable t. So yes, remember that smooth means infinitely differentiable and we can write it as this. So yeah, so when the curve, being, this curve is being parameterized as by dt. So, uh, if I take the vector, uh, this one, uh, this one, if it is no vat 0, means we are taking the vector derivative dy i by dt. If it is no vat 0, we call it something which is called a non singular path. It is no vat 0, that means it yields to a value, it will be a non singular path. So, remember this type of path never terminates. Now we come to what we were talking that is a straight line smooth let us see so here we take a uh, straight line is not smooth since after taking the first derivative we are left with a constant so here is a nice simple example uh, if i take y equals to 3x and then i go ahead i get 3 so it is a constant so here it shows that a straight line is not smooth so now that we have understood what is called a smooth path 
and what is called a smooth surface we move to the next important uh, thing that we can uh, okay this is a certain parameterization example so you can just quickly glance through it i'm not taking much time to go through it pi can be independent a and b this can be parameterized as it follows even unit sphere can be parameterized and this is a little bit important that if i take a function r3 mapping to r what we get a jacobian matrix right this is the jacobian and we can parameterize the jacobian further into this so these are nothing just pure simple examples of parameterizing the utility of parameterizing are immense it helps us in calculating and creating functions and thereby it's, it's very important okay so what is a chart it is not our school days chart that we used to sit down and draw this is something else so let us quickly look into what is a chart okay so in general a coordinate chart is a way of expressing the points of a small neighborhood that means things around it usually on a manifold as coordinates in euclidean space so it is just like that so an example from geography is the coordinate of the functions latitude and longitude and mathematics one describes a manifold using an atlas an atlas consists of individual charts that describe the regions of the manifold so just to give you a visual illustration this is m which is a manifold this would lead to atlas atlas has got several charts all these charts leads to atlas and these charts comprises of different regions those red ones which i have just shown you in the uh, in the figure right so we are basically describing a manifold using an atlas and from this atlas it will be the charts which describes different regions in the manifold okay so now we come a little bit to uh, what we call uh, a kind of a definition of uh, manifold so uh, this phi u can we can define coordinates x a in the set u so right so these are actually what they are called they are called basically pullback of the standard coordinates r n right so from here we what we get is this right uh yeah so the the pullback coordinates and uh, this is how it happens now this right hand side this one is just the value of the standard coordinate of x a in r n and this uh, at the point phi u p so it looks like this right so as you can see that uh, you have already got the uh, r n as the manifold and uh, this phi u and the negative uh, phi u uh, negative these are happening so this is smooth so as you see the level set of coordinates as we are called these are defined as pullbacks of the standard coordinates and its value through this so this one is the standard coordinate of x a and this is how so charts are basically you know helping to map a manifold from here to here but this is not all yeah so you see this the inverse is also but this is not all we generally need more than one chart to cover the manifold because it's a big one right so an atlas is a collection of charts that cover the entire manifold so you see atlas is basically those charts which are covered uh, it is a superset right it's a subset would be the chart uh, it can happen only when the two charts overlap and that is why we have phi u and then now we have phi v right so this is the chart uh, uh, let us see how it happens so the intersection obviously would uh, be not equal to zero and once it overlaps we can define transition function so now you see what is a transition function let me show you the figure it looks um, almost like this now uh, this is the overlapping area right u and v and this function goes from here to here very simple right so uh, we define those transition functions so that the charts when they are overlapping it can calculate that overlapping function so and the inverse should also be true and the intersection should be not equal to zero obviously and these charts finally comprises of the atlas which defines the manifold and because the manifold cannot be defined through one chart there will always be overlapping of those charts so you see these one which i told that two charts phi u and phi v overlap okay so now we come to the most important and the central part of our video where we are talking of the investigating the curved space time and we have learned charts 
we have learned atlases we have learned mapping is that manifold but how it will be very important and applicable to a uh, general theory of relativity okay so okay so how yes how our learning is related to physics of a space time okay so first our target is that we need to construct all of the mathematical tools in such a way so that we can uh, define and understand minkowski space time curves tangent vectors etc and most importantly we can do a little bit of calculus on that and we also need to construct and understand the new structure of space time so that we can define gravity or whatever the curvature of space time okay so uh, first of all you will see uh, this if you don't understand you can just skip it this comes actually from my uh, from the video metric tensor this is equal to this right gig equals to del ig now you see this is something which is called a minkowski metric and this is the speed of light we all know so we call this manifold flat minkowski space on m4 right now in minkowski space the length of vectors is different to that of the euclidean space the length is determined by the metric right okay so here it is on the three dimensional euclidean space it looks like this right now but there is a difference between the three dimension we'll see right now yeah so this is how it looks in minkowski four space you see there is a marked difference now so what is the difference now in euclidean space the set of all points at a distance for example this one are from a point e3 if i consider this to be e3 right is just a fear of radius r right so again let me repeat that in euclidean space the set of all points at distance r from point e3 is just a sphere of radius r in minkowski space the set of all points at a distance r from a point m4 looks something like a hyperbolic surface right it looks like a hyperbolic surface so it is it is just an hyperbola and what this hyperbola gives us is something like this right so when we go for hyperbola in euclidean space place when r becomes zero we get a point obviously when it is zero but in m4 we get this one which is called a light cone and you know much more about this the future the past and the present and all those black hole structures of space time everything is being defined in uh, this uh, the um, this uh, light cone right so you see what happens earlier that this yields to something which is just r but in minkowski space it leads to hyperbolic surface this is the first difference that means you are using now uh, differential geometry to find out the curvature of space time second thing is that because in euclidean space r equals to 0 we get a point here we get in m4 we get a kind of a this is the light cone and through the light cone we can do a lot of calculations this is the first kind of a application of differential geometry to find out the curve space time now further if we go if we take a uh, you know euclidean curve, uh, flat space time and this is a straight line which is going in euclidean space then when we move to a kind of a curve space time for example a sphere and we measure the lines as we know that the straight line becomes a geodesic like a curvature and certain portion for example this red portion i want to calculate anything i want to calculate a curvature i want to calculate the stress tensor or whatever so i take this thing out and put it up in a manifold which is m and then you see these points actually forms what is called the atlas and the charts i hope i can make things understand the application of differential geometry these atlas and charts which we just learned how and how it is important it is important in this way because atlas and charts are used to you know i would say dissect a manifold and get those results how that we do that that is to atlas and charts and overlapping etc further if i want to calculate for example a curvature or a stress tensor as we all know one uh, particular chart won't be possible for us we will take two charts and this portion is something which is overlapping 
and this is the same structure that we just mentioned and this overlapping is being calculated by this. So you understand why do we need the charts and atlases? We eat anything. We can calculate anything uh, on a curvature, Gaussian curvature, gravity, uh, speed, velocity, anything. So we need those things because the curvature, stress tensor, etc., everything is dependent on manifold. Manifold is being calculated by charts, which in return to atlases and all those overlapping calculations are being done through differential geometry. Okay, if you take a sphere like this, and if you take a same kind of an open ball, we will say, and these is we just learned it is an open ball. How does it help? It helps to analyze an open ball along with its properties and helps us to divide it into different sets and perform those operations. So we need a metric space where x will be an element of x and then we will get the ball which is less than r and we can do those calculations. Right. So differential geometry when taken into Einstein's general theory of relativity and when we are doing all those calculations of a particular manifold which is dissected and we have taken a small portion which is an open ball and those balls how we can calculate the metric etc are being done in this part of the in in this way so you can understand now how things really happen okay so i will give you now a kind of a broader picture although we have other things mathematically to cover which i will cover up in the next part of the video so we initially start with what we call a euclidean metric then we move into manifold right these manifolds are being taken care by the mathematics of set theory. We have just seen that, right? Now, these sets are basically collection of objects. For example, these objects. These objects have different kind of properties. These properties are either studied by topology, which is on a global scale, or by differential geometry, which is on a local scale. And then we get a sphere. And out of this sphere, we need an open ball, closed set, open set all those calculations etc comes in so the differential geometry actually deals with open balls it deals with parameterization and smooth paths smooth functions and so on so that concludes our video the most important would be this one how we investigated curve space time so we, you see how we use open ball how we use smooth paths uh, because in a curve space time we need smooth paths in order to use calculus so you, we use parameterization to dissect them and make things easy. We use set so that things become easier. We get a collection of objects and we study the properties through topology or through differential geometry so that we understand the space-time curvature and the internal workings of that space-time much better. So that's all. Uh, I think we have covered a lot into the video. We also can have a parallel vector field which moves along a small manifold and you see again a parallel transport which is happening we are trying to uh, keep the vector right we have i have covered a lot of parallel transport into my generativity theory but this differential geometry definitely is required so for that we need to understand parallel transport christoffel symbols covariant derivative and riemann curvature tensor which is coming up in the next part of the video plus uh, certain things more so this actually shows why and how the learning of differential geometry finally comes to use in Einstein's general theory of relativity. So that's a quick summary. We learned what is a manifold, what is a transition map, that's overlapping part. We also learned open balls, open disks and open sets and we see, saw how it is important in relativity, how to parameterize, how to get smooth folds, paths and smooth surfaces. We came out of the notion that straight line is not smooth. We also learned charts, charts and atlas, and we learned the uh, the relation between generativity, differential geometry, Euclidean and Minkowski space. How these tools are being used in uh, relativity and the connection between uh, tools between uh, differential geometry and physics. So that's all. That is, this is one part of the video. We are not done yet. We have. I will be constructing several uh, uh, part two, part three, and so on because there are a lot of mathematics in differential geometry, and most interestingly, it is very much related to Einstein's general theory of relativity. Thank you very much for watching this video. 
please put up your comment don't forget to subscribe to my channel click on the bell icon and click on all so that you get all the notification from physics from students uh, wishing you a great weekend ahead this is shaunak signing up from physics for students promising you to come back with yet another exciting video on physics and mathematics till then goodbye stay safe stay happy and learn physics and mathematics and be happy and be merry thank you very much for watching this video thank you for watching this video we appreciate your time and patience if you want to connect with us and provide further feedback comment or suggestions please email us at contact.physicsforstudents@gmail.com you can also follow us on facebook instagram and linkedin see you soon in the next video